Hello everyone and uh, a warm welcome to this uh, workshop on biomass combustion and uh, carbon capture and utilization and sequestration. Uh, thank you very much to the seven speakers uh, for agreeing to speak uh, at this uh, event and thank you very much uh, to the audience uh, for your interest in the topic. Uh, I think we have uh, <clears throat> around uh, yeah, between 80 and 90 um, uh, registrants to, to, to the workshop here. We are situated in, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, the speakers, some of the speakers at least, uh, and then uh, <clears throat> we have uh, registrations from more or less all over the world, from Canada, from India, around the globe. We are very excited uh, to get started and uh, we hope that uh, we, with this ev when event, will gain uh, new important knowledge uh, that we can that can help uh, paving the path towards uh, negative uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We hope that we, during this workshop, will have the opportunity to uh, to discuss experiences and to focus on which questions to ask when considering carbon capture, uh, utilization, sequestration on uh, biomass combustion plants. Bye. Becos has become uh, very important uh, in uh, some countries, uh, yeah, an important way to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and to create the negative emissions. Uh, we'll hear more about that. And the focus on the workshop is uh, the consequences for for operation of the of the combustion plants. Uh, we have uh, teamed up in this uh, workshop with the uh, task 36. Um, uh, and I'm representing task 32 in the IA Bioenergy. I'll come back to that. Uh, so we will talk both about waste to energy plants, uh, focusing on carbon capture and on biomass uh, combustion plants. With this, uh, with this agenda here, we'll hear uh, presentations from plants uh, in Copenhagen, in Norway, uh, in uh, other places in, uh, in Denmark, uh, and then in, uh, in Skabek, and we will hear something from uh, Stockholm uh, in Sweden, and a study from uh, from Natural Resources Canada, and uh, turn back to Copenhagen in the end before we uh, move to a, a panel debate in the end of the very quite long workshop. <clears throat> My name is Morten Tony Hansen, and I'm uh, involved with the IA Bioenergy Task 32 Biomass Combustion. I'm employed with a small uh, consultancy company called Air Energy Analysis. And I just wanted to uh, inform you a little bit about IA Bioenergy uh, in case you don't know that uh, already. Uh, it's a technology collaboration program uh, functioning. Um, within the framework work of uh, of the international energy agency the goal is to create collaboration and information exchange on all sorts of bioenergy res research technology development demonstration and um, uh, implementation as well as policy we uh, like to say that uh, we disseminate knowledge that uh, aims at uh, uh, reducing the number of mistakes, or if somebody else has made the mistake already, then uh, nobody needs to do that again. Yeah. We have a, a work program in IEA Bioenergy that is carried out uh, by a number of tasks and uh, takes place in uh, task-specific projects and in, in, in collaborative uh, projects, special projects. And this following figure is, uh, is a way to illustrate that we have uh, tasks that uh, focus on resources, we have tasks that focus on conversion, and uh, we have tasks that focus on markets, and there's a system perspective uh, surrounding it all. Um, the tasks involved uh, organizing this workshop is uh, combustion tasks, as mentioned, and uh, uh, task 36 that uh, works on waste to energy and circular economy. Task 40 is uh, called uh, Deployment of Bio-Based Economy and uh, works on syst the system perspective and also it's also the lead of uh, the BECUS uh, project uh, that uh, this workshop is a part of. 
And that was all about the introduction. A, a few practical notes. Um, we have uh, four speakers uh, present here uh, in, in the room at Air Energy Analysis, and we have three online. And the audience, uh, you are all online. We have a three, team of three uh, from here to handle practicalities, and uh, we plan to have a break uh, halfway through. Um, we have a, an option for, uh, uh, for, for asking questions. There is a Q&A space that we will check. And we hope that uh, you speakers uh, will also take the opportunity, while not speaking, to, to check the Q&A and assist in responding to, to questions to the extent you can do that. We record uh, uh, the event here, uh, the presentations. We do not record the panel debates in the end, but we record the, the, the presentations uh, and we plan to publish them on the Task 32 website and IEA Bioenergy website. Yes, I think that was about introduction. Um, Christian, I would like to hand it over to you now. Uh, Christian Bang is my colleague, and he's leading the Becus uh, 2.0 uh, project that we are a part of here in, in this activity. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. As Morton mentioned, I also uh, work here at EIA Energy Analysis. And uh, in terms of IA Bioenergy, I'm uh, the Danish country representative for Task 40, which was one of the, the tasks uh, Morton had on the last uh, the previous slide there. And uh, I'm also one of the co leaders of the Intertask project, the uh, Becus, uh, what we call 2.0. And the reason we call it uh, 2.0 is because uh, I've just been handed a note saying that camera. Yes, Bob. Can you turn it on? Oh, okay. Um, Sorry. Apologies for the interruption. Uh, we're, we're good. Um, the reason it's called Becus 2.0 is because uh, it's the second Intertask Becus project. The first um, was carried out from 2019 to 2021. And uh, I participated in this, but was not uh, one of the leaders. But the objective of this pro uh, the initial project was to improve the understanding of the opportunities and obstacles uh, related to the deployment of Becus in, in different industries. And the approach we took there was looking at technology readiness and economics, uh, uh, business models, and policy design and regula regulatory frameworks. And we kind of took a two-pronged approach here. There was uh, system studies, uh, cross-industrial, conceptual aspects, and uh, industry cases and deep dives. Uh, actually, some of the uh, presenters here were, were also involved with, with these cases. Uh, now, there was quite a few uh, publications. Uh, I've shared the links here. I won't go, go through them all here. But you're very welcome to, to take a look if you're interested in those. And uh, if you kind of look at the, the key findings uh, from the Becus 1.0, uh, was that much of the, the technology uh, can be a large extent, large extent because they're proven. Uh, many of the people we, the experts we talked to, said that uh, there's obstacles, but they could likely be over, overcome. But on the other end, the, the policy measures required to make these uh, investments and undertake these projects and get them from demonstration to deployment. Uh, they were lacking, and this is something that would have to be improved going forward. So we looked at uh, Finish 1.0 and think, okay, there's quite a few things we'd like to continue looking at. This was, uh, one of the things was deployment options for small scale um, options. This is something we'll be talking about today, so that's, that's great. There's also this question of uh, Becus versus BecU, that is, when to utilize the CO2, when to store it. And one of the important parameters to look at when undertaking this decision. Uh, synergies and trade-offs uh, with other system services, taking more of a system perspective. Um, and running back to this, this, this policies and incentives um, governing Becus, particularly um, IOC's view. 
And lastly, but uh, of course not least, the sustainability, sustainability aspects of risks. So these are all kind of things we wanted to keep in mind in developing the, the second uh, inter, intertask project, which is um, which is running a start kicked off in the second quarter of 2022, which runs through the end of 2024. And here, the, the overarching goal is to take a systematic analysis of how to facilitate deployment of uh, Becus applications. So again, reverting back to some of the, the students from, from the last one, key questions we want to address are, uh, in any given situation, do we want to sequester CO2? Should we utilize CO2 over what time frame? And what are the most important criteria and parameters for making these decisions? Of course, it's also very important to look at how to monetize the carbon uh, products that bioenergy can deliver. And the governance systems, um, what factors and parameters should guide this uh, decision-making process. And last but not least, what options are available for small scale? You know, uh, they're also quite interesting to look at. And so we're happy to hear that there'll be a presenter and look at this today. In terms of outputs, uh, the individual um, work package outputs will vary. There's some workshops and forecasts, summary reports, and there will be a final um, synthesis report summarizing uh, all the findings. So I've included some extra slides here that will be um, available. Uh, this kind of shows the, the different work packages and their focus. We have the first three kind of focus on case studies and the system studies. And today, um, today's event is essentially part of work package two, uh, biomass combustion and CO2 capture led by. So on that note, I know we have some really interesting presentations, so uh, I'd like to jump on jump onto those. So I think I'll hand it over to back to Morton. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christian, for this uh, this introduction. Yes, we will uh, move straight on, having uh, already gained a little on time. I hope that's, uh, that we will keep it this way. Um, the first uh, real presentation uh, today is uh, on demonstration, uh, the demonstration plant at uh, the waste to energy uh, plant in Copenhagen. In, uh, in Copenhagen. This is by uh, Yannick Kabel, who sits next to me here. And uh, Yannick is employed as Carbon Capture uh, Project Manager at the Amager Amma Resource Center in Copenhagen, in Denmark. Please, Yannick, yes. let's hear what you have to say. Thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to speak here and to speak to you all. Uh, yes, as Morten said, so uh, I work for ARC. We are a company that handles all types of waste. And, uh, and that which cannot be used otherwise, we uh, also use when we incinerate and, and burn and, and utilize for heating power and then we would like to um, to also capture the CO2 of our plant. That's, that's that here. Um, we burn about uh, five, uh, 500,000 uh, tons, tons of waste a year. And uh, as you can see from this figure, which is from uh, 21, but it's, it's, it's roughly the same. Um, there's about a ton of uh, CO2 uh, when you burn a ton of waste. And, uh, the total emissions of the plant is, is roughly 500 tons of CO2 a year. Or it, maybe it's, it's high. We believe we can capture that much CO2. Uh, and, uh, and the largest, uh, larger part of it is biogenic and, and a smaller part is, uh, is fossil. I have two slides, basic carbon capture, which of course, many of you probably know, but but uh, just so we uh, agree on what we've been talking about here. So this is a rough sketch of how uh, our current uh, plan works. So we have um, we get in some waste or biomass and we incinerate it, and we have we utilize the heating, and we have a turbine so we can make power, and then we have a lot of cleaning systems here. We also make district heating. A lot of cleaning here, so we have very clean uh, gas. Um, but then we would like to add another step to it, which is this last part, which is an air mine based uh, carbon capture process. Um, and how does that work? So this is uh, an animated figure, and in a second you will see uh, these, these little dots. Uh, so in here we have the industrial gas, the, the 
the flue gas from the stack, which will enter this absorber, which is a tower, and there's another tower here called a desorber. And, uh, and you can see here, so this white icon is the gases, red is CO2, which is starts in the gas, and then it will be captured by the amides, and then we can we, you can see what happens. So the amide is uh, is uh, is brought here, and then we heat it up into the desorber. And when we heat it up, we can separate the CO2, and then we can reuse the amide. And you see up here is the industrial gas without the CO2. So this is basically how CO2 capture works on an amine plant. I'm just going to show it one more time. So the amine is uh, is reused, um, and the CO2 is captured, and uh, and this it's of course a little bit more advanced, but uh, but this is basically how it works. So what are we doing at Arc? Well, we decided that before we want to build a full scale, we should we should gain some knowledge and uh, and learn a lot of stuff on on how to do carbon capture. So we started by building a smaller uh, small pilot plant, which we ran for nine months, and uh, we built it for very flexible operations, uh, and we did a, a lot of tests uh, and and work on energy optimization, and then it was a catch and release. So we catch, caught the CO2, and then we released it again. And we proved that it worked. And uh, this was a very successful project. I should mention that this whole project is a partnership between uh, these partners. You see the corner here: DTU, Humble, Arc, and uh, Penda Unit Engineering. Um, and Penda is the company that develops it, and DTU is the university, and Humble is a consulting engineer company. And we are all supported by the Danish government via UDP. So, first. Uh, plan was the pilot. Now we are building the demonstration plan, and it's it's currently at Arc right now, and uh, it's able to capture 160 kilos of CO2 uh, an hour, so uh, about four tons a day. It's built for stable operations. Um, we uh, we just turned it on, so we would like to uh, work on uh, on simulation of district heating integration, and then uh, we are actually. Keep the CO2, we dry it, cool it, and then we uh, utilize it, or we send it to somebody who utilizes it. And the purpose of, of all this, of course, is to gain the necessary knowledge that we can design and build a full-scale power plant. And uh, as I said, I write, wrote soon here, but I think our, our manager yesterday told in the national news that we will build something by uh, by 29. So that's that's the plan. So first, I'll show you a 3D animation of of uh, oh, not an animation, just a picture here, because the the plant is actually built inside the plant, and it's difficult to take a picture of something inside something. But it's this is how it looks like the carbon capture plant, and this is the outside uh, facilities where we have a tank and we have liquefaction units, um, and we have a reclaimer which helps uh, us use the amine for a longer period. Um, and then uh, we have we have trucks arriving about each week to pick up uh, the CO2 from our plant. And uh, currently the CO2 is uh, transported by a company called Linde, and it's utilized in uh, greenhouses. It doesn't have to continue that way. We would very much like to uh, put the CO2 in the ground. And uh, when that becomes possible, we will we will do that. Um, but uh, this is currently how it is. So outside there's a liquefaction unit, we have some carbon scan units which we use to test and verify the quality of the CO2, so we can prove that it is actually um, food grade CO2, we have a tank and, uh, and, a, and a truck, CO2 truck. So this is, uh, this is a picture of the inside of our, of our waste to energy plant. These are two stacks that, that continue out of the building and, and, and emits uh, the yeah, CO2 and uh, water vapor. This below here is uh, where we measure everything. And uh, these pipes you can see up here are pipes that where we take out flue gas. It's a small sample of the flue gas of the power plant. And we take it down to the floor. It's a very uh, high building. So we take it down to the floor where we position, position the demo plant. And then we can re-emit the flue gas without CO2 in, into the same pipe. 
and this is the the cover catcher plant way down in, on the floor of the plant. And uh, here you see the the blue gas enter the plant, and behind that you see it exit without structure in it. Uh, and here I have a picture of the, some measurement stations that we built. So this is uh, the flue gas return after we have uh, captured the CO2. We have to prove that we didn't pollute our flue gas. So we measure uh, ammonia and we measure CO2, we measure oxygen, temperature and pressure, uh, and we do that live. And then additionally we do we take out samples uh, throughout the project and then we Prove, or we hope we can prove that we don't pollute other gases. So this is very important for the design of a full scale that you know what are the emissions and uh, yeah, what to look for and what to, to how to design so you don't have any emissions, any bad emissions. This is outside. This is the reclaimer unit. Um, a pipe in here. Um, that box should come later. Sorry. This is uh, the reclaimer waste where we uh, we accumulate the waste from the reclaimer. And uh, well, the more we run, the more we know what it actually is. It, it is, of course, something that came from the flue gas, but, but we would like to look at, at what it is and see how we can best uh, treat it. Um, the most expensive way to treat it is, is to uh, treat it as hazardous waste, which we have done before. That's very expensive. And uh, we would like to look into if it's if it's possible and if we could get the right commitment, if we can incinerate it, and that would be a la large uh, cost saving on our on a full scale plant. Um, so that's why we are we are collecting this waste and analyzing it and then looking into, well, um, what can we do with it? This is uh, the refraction unit right here. This is the a tank for CO2. It takes 40 tons of liquid CO2. And these are our carbon scan and sensory chamber units, which we use to test and verify the quality of the CO2 before we put it in the tank and before we let the trucks pick it up. Where's the liquefaction? This is the liquefaction unit right here. So this, this unit uh, compresses and liquefies the CO2. So before that, it's, it's just uh, a gas. And after that, it becomes, becomes a liquid that we put into the tank. So um, we have uh, just started and we uh, we will do uh, uh, three general campaigns. So we are, we are planned to run for one year. It's supposed to say uh, uh, 24 out here. I'm sorry for that. Um, so we will run with two solvents. We have a MIA. Uh, solvent and we have a, something called a Caesar solvent, and, uh, and the reason we are we are changing is because of uh, of temperatures that we um, we expect that during the winter we will have uh, lower flue gas temperatures because we will turn on the heat pumps of the the waste to energy plant. So it's important to get uh, guess get different data points when we run the demonstration plant. Yeah, so we'll use existing heat pumps. We will. Uh, simulate district heating integration and we will try different cooling configurations we will have a sample gas sample those are very expensive so we have only four one here we'll run the caesar case which is the one where we expect the lowest energy uh, consumption to capture co2 we'll study solid degradation emissions have two samples and then finally in the spring of 24 we will uh, expect to have flu warm flue gas Continue district heating integrations and then more cooling configurations and a, and a last assembly. And uh, throughout this whole project, uh, this process, uh, we will uh, yeah we will produce CO2 and uh, and we believe that it will continue to be food grade and and if it is, then it, that will be shipped off for utilization. This is a sketch of uh, of the measurements we're doing. Um, so uh, this is uh, the existing plan, the, these blue parts, and we have an existing measuring stations which measures almost everything you can imagine. Um, and then after that, that's where we take out the flue gas, a sample of it, and we collect it down. We run it through our carbon capture plant. We um, measure the quality of the CO2, as I just showed you. 
we weigh it down so we know how much is uh, in the tank and how much is picked up by trucks. And then we measure it again at the, at the uh, so we measure the flue gas before we emit it in the stacks. And we use these uh, laser gas devices to measure CO2 and ammonia and this uh, zirconium stick to measure oxygen. We take uh, four samples where we measure these, these amines um, and nitrosamines. Uh, the plant is designed to capture 90 to 95% CO2. Um, it is it is supposed to be running automatically, or it can run automatically. But of course, we will have uh, we have uh, technicians uh, there anyway, and uh, and also we uh, we will run stable operations, but we will also do some different configurations. It takes about 30 minutes for a servant to um, take a whole rotation. We can we can play with something called intercoolers, um, which means that we can we can work with how to get the lowest energy consumption, and we can we can do that by by moving where the currents where the amines go. Uh, and as I said, we remove remove the the impurities and the heat stable salts uh, in a reclaimer. And that's that is the reclaimer I just told you about. This is a sketch of how the plant works. I'm not gonna go through it, but I guess you will have the slides so you can you can look at it when you have better time. Um, I just have a, a couple of results from our pilot plant. Just wanted to to show you because we don't have any results yet from the demo, but we will and we will publish them when we get them. So I just wanted to show you a little bit on the, on degradations of solvents. On the, on the pilot, we did not have a reclaimer, so we saw and we expected to see a lot of uh, degradation of the solvents. And, and you can you can measure that, but actually you can also just see it, that it becomes darker. And then uh, we installed, uh, and we had a problem in the, in the beginning, so we installed some filters. And, and then you can see we could we were able to reduce the, uh, the degradation of the solvents. And this was um, from July to December. Um, we, yeah, and as you can see, there's a lot of degradation. We believe that we will have a lot less degradation uh, when we use this uh, reclaimer. There's a lot of different results from this plan. These are some articles that are already out there, and and these two are will probably be out in a couple very soon. So uh, so there's five articles out uh, on this uh, this project that you're very welcome to to read. You can also find them on our homepage. This is direct linked where you can find the links. And if you are able to read Danish, you can also take the short link and then navigate to where you'll find these articles that are published. This is also where we will publish uh, all the articles that we plan to uh, produce based on uh, the results from our demo plan. That was what I had to say. Thank you very much, Yannick. It's very interesting. <clears throat> uh, we hope to see a development uh, that also results in a full-scale, uh, full-scale capture plant. Yeah. Yes. Me too. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you have questions, you can use the Q and A uh, uh, box, and uh, I put them there, and we will uh, attend to them uh, at the end of the of the web, uh, workshop here. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you again, Yannick. We will now continue uh, in the waste to energy uh, business uh, and uh, we'd like to hear uh, news from uh, Klimetsrud waste to energy plant in Oslo. Uh, Michael Besilan will uh, tell us a little bit about that. Um, Michael is a uh, representative of uh, Norway in uh, task 36 in IA Bioenergy and he is employed with the uh, with the uh, Sintef uh, as a senior research scientist. Uh, yes. And Michael, are you ready there? It looks like that. Yes, yes. I can see your slides. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Good, good. So please ahead. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Uh... Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy today to present the um, key elements on the 
CCS project at the Clements Loop uh, Waste to Energy Plant in, in Oslo, in Norway. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. Yes, I'm working in, in Trondheim in Norway and uh, at SINDEF and representing TAS statistics. Uh, so today, uh, here is a little bit about the content. Uh, I will gi uh, give some um, technical comments and, and aspects, but I think um, I will give a, try to give a full background story about the project and also the bigger uh, context around the climate threat project. Uh, so then it's very important to look at the whole timeline and uh, also the budget and the current situation. So first I will start with the, many of you probably have heard about the Norwegian full-scale CCS project for long chip and then two elements for the, 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 cap, the CO2 capture, of course, but you have also the transport and storage for northern lights and the CO2 capture aspects. And then I will go a little bit into more details about the whole uh, uh, quite, uh, exciting and eventful story of Clemens uh, part of the project. So first, Longship. So Longship is the Norwegian government full-scale uh, carbon capture and storage project. And the main elements uh, can be somewhat detailed now. You have the capture CO2 at the cement factory, uh, Edelgard materials uh, in Norway. But then you have the one which is really interesting for us today. It's the Hafsfield to Oslo Celsius West Energy Plant, located in Klemensfield in Oslo. And finally, Northern Lights for a transport and storage solution. I will not say anything about the, the cement factory today, but I will, uh, I will say a bit more about the other element. So Northern Lights, what is Northern Lights? So that's the first open source CO2 transport and storage infrastructure. Open source means that any uh, CO2 producer can enter into a contract to uh, get its uh, CO2 stored there. Um, the first uh, phase is for 1.2 million tons CO2 per year. Uh, and um, the only thing is that it's open, but about half of it, 0 0.8 million tons, have been reserved for the cement factory and for uh, chemists with waste to energy. The rest is open for anybody. And I indicated here that uh, Earthstead in Denmark signed a contract for about 400,000 tons CO2, biogenic CO2 from uh, two, uh, two of their plants. So there, there are still available capacity uh, from the 1.5 and phase two will be to extend it to 5 million tons CO2. Hopefully the first phase starts operating uh, next week. The owners you see here, big companies, Equino, Shell and Total Energy. And it is supported by the, the Norwegian company. So then, uh, yeah, for those interested, I put just some of the specification for the CO2. Of course, uh, you can uh, not put uh, any type of quality. Okay, so then, full uh, care projects, uh, transport and storage, and now let's look at uh, the CO2 capture related to the climate and waste energy plants. So here I give some details on these plants. Uh, there is nothing really uh, uh, unusual about the plants. Uh, three lines, they are called K1, K2, K3. They have different uh, new gas treatment systems and different technologies. K3 is the newest one, uh, here represented at the bottom. But you see all the typical elements of an advanced uh, system uh, to be able to fulfill the, the bad, uh, breath requirement for waste energy. Uh, if you want some more details, uh, uh, I put the uh, uh, link here uh, on an article. I will talk a little bit more about the article later. Uh, so uh, uh, the three lines together uh, process about uh, 400 kilotons of residual waste per year, producing about 400 kilotons CO2, mostly biogenic. So probably a little bit over 50%, 50 to 60% biogenic. And they represent that the single biggest point emission for the city of Oslo. And Oslo has very ambitious uh, goals to reduce its emissions. So uh, the CCS from this plant is key to achieve this goal. The plant produces mainly a district team, but also some ambitious. 
So then uh, after the plant itself, the carbon capture uh, and storage and transport and storage elements for climate trade. So I don't go into details. Very good that we got uh, the, the first uh, presentation by Ark about the uh, amine. So that will be uh, what is planned is also an amine uh, capture system. Um, a shell cancel uh, technology, I believe. Um, the conditioning is done on site and then trucks will transport the CO2 to uh, the arbor a few kilometers from the tennis plant. And from there, we will go to permanent storage for the northern light that I refer to, about 2.6 kilometers below the, the surface. The permanent storage. So that's a bit of the whole value change going to some payments for the Yeah, so a uh, few comments here. Yeah, I'm going to go into details because I want to talk about other things concerning the, the whole climate story. story. But regarding a little bit west to energy and carbon capture operation, we heard also a lot from the first uh, presentation. But I can mention that, uh, yeah, so the, the, the proven technology and the one just chosen is admins capture. Uh, several experimental campaigns have been carried out, and uh, the results, uh, at least some of the results, have been published. The first link, the BOI I, I put in the presentation refers to an extensive article showing the biggest uh, experimental campaign, 7,000 uh, hours uh, of operation. Of course, a lot of sampling, uh, sampling points, a lot of uh, analytical results. So that's very interesting, I can recommend. But based on these experimental campaigns, it was decided that that was the, the, the right thing to do. It was working. So. Uh, from then, uh, we have been also involved in other projects with the with the Celsius uh, around, especially uh, looking at if the um, because as you know the the flue gas from waste to energy, even though it's clean, you can still find trace uh, uh, concentrations uh, of many elements from the whole uh, uh, periodic table. So to look at how the flue gas composition and its fluctuation, especially. Uh, abrupt changes and so on can be a challenge. So we look at that and, and try to identify so um, uh, challenges and maybe opportunities, especially related to degradation of the amines, uh, corrosion challenges and so on. So here we identify some points which uh, one has to be very careful uh, around, especially the fact that to look at average values over one year or, or, or one week and so on, it's not good enough. We should really dig into the data to see if uh, the fluctuation and instability in waste composition or, or, or if some trouble with the flue gas treatment can impact your carbon capture. Ongoing work. And of course, a lot of uh, discussion around the energy integration of your system, for example, with the XTC. Okay, so that was it a little bit about uh, operation and, and uh, how to operate those uh, systems. So if we go back a little bit more to the whole uh, story about MS3, the first feasibility study was uh, in 2015. Several pilot campaigns and so on leading up to the final feed report and that uh, then the decision to go forward, but of course, Important element is to get the full funding. And this was several back and forth around the, the funding. Um, uh, the fact that first the, the parliament, Norwegian parliament, gave conditional funding, so basically only half. And then uh, Clement Sud did not get funding for the innovation fund. So in 2020, 2021, uh, beginning of 22, there was a lot of back and forth to. to be able to find the full funding before starting construction. And then finally, a new industrial partnership um, uh, was established in uh, March 2022 uh, that, uh, that ensured the full funding. And then very fast after that, just in the summer of 2022, demolition and construction was started with the goal of starting operation in 2026. Yes, so a little bit about the, the partnership. I can show how it is built. So here you see different. So the total total um, uh, budget around uh, uh, 900 million euros. 
And uh, as you can see, it was uh, uh, mainly uh, financed by the uh, city of Oslo and the Norwegian state. But it was a power machine for, uh, for different entities. So uh, this was secured, the project was starting. Uh, but then um, when the um, inflation started, it was decided that the project should enter uh, should update its timeline and budget and uh, look a little bit at the status. So this was um, uh, done and it was uh, supposed to be uh, updated by March 2023. Uh, and what was announced on March April 2023 is that uh, looking at the new estimates, the increase uh, uh, in budget was uh, necessary if it was really significant. I couldn't find, um, I only used publicly relevant information in this presentation. I couldn't find any uh, official, mem uh, official number when making the presentation. Maybe it is in some articles, but let's say it was significant double digit increase uh, due to different factors, the inflation, the unstable uh, situation uh, uh, in the world. And also uh, the, the uh, weak uh, Norwegian currency. Uh, but there were also some other aspects around the arbor solution, electricity, and so on. And based on that, I would say that that's now my work. Sadly, it was decided to hold the project completely and enter a 12 month cost reduction, reduction phase. So since uh, April, the project, no more uh, construction uh, is happening, and everything is being uh, reevaluated. And hopefully, uh, uh, it will restart in, uh, in a slightly modified form uh, by the beginning of next year. And maybe um, the final thing I wanted to say that's also my. Uh, we are looking at it. I mean, but you can see it probably from what I said and from this slide is that this these issues around uh, budget and, uh, and factors making the project um, much more expensive have nothing to do with the carbon capture and storage elements actually. So it's it's uh, other uh, factors. Uh, and I think it's very important to communicate, uh, especially to the general public, because of course this reaches the general public and, and and can be misunderstood as that there is a problem with CCS, right? Uh, well, it is um, the project has some challenges, but it is not directly related to. I think I went maybe pretty fast, but that what I had to say. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, yes, we yeah, could yeah. hear you. <laughs> I just had trouble in mute, unmuting the microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we uh, we will uh, uh, get back to you in the uh, panel debate uh, with a uh, uh, couple of questions, I'm sure. Um, and then. Uh, We'd like to continue now uh, on a smaller scale uh, type of path. Uh, we will hear about uh, experiences with a demonstration plant or a pilot plant that was installed in the Tisted Waste to Energy plant in the northern part of, of Denmark. And we would like to welcome uh, Morten Pieper from SEG. Uh, Morten is uh, managing director at uh, the company SEG. Uh, it's a Danish company that supplies uh, energy related hardware at large, I guess, uh, and uh, a bit of consultancy uh, and amongst others, uh, carbon capture uh, technology. You can continue from there, Morten. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me today. Um, to put it in scale, we are about 10% uh, the size of uh, Ama resources center in everything uh, uh, except for ambitions. Uh, and my agenda is I'll give an also short presentation of SEG 
Uh, then I'll go through just the Varman machine, the technology and the numbers. Then I will go through the first steps with carbon capture pilot plant that we did in 21. And then I'll go through the ensuing roadmap and feasibility studies that have been going on in 22 and 23. Uh, I'll go through the challenges we've met within each track of the roadmap and how they're being addressed. And then I'll end up with doing an update on the current status and the projections and plan at uh, TISTA. Um, I also had that trouble. Use the pad. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shortly about SEG, we uh, we have plus 25 years experience within flue gas condensation and flue gas treatment plants. We have worked on a lot of geothermal uh, uh, installations uh, both in Denmark uh, and uh, we are currently working on two in Poland, one in Toron and one in Siraz. The one in uh, Toron is uh, we're going out of warranty on our, on our surface plant there in the end of this year. And the one series is being uh, commissioned in uh, November. And we're doing part of the surface surface plan there. Of course, most uh, the heat pumps and, and, and related stuff to that. We have done about 80 uh, large absorption heat pumps, chillers, and we do our own brand of uh, flue gas scrubbers also. Our specialty is thermodynamics, chemistry, mechanics, and electrical engineering. Um, as an example, I can mention the, the plus 40 megawatt absorbed absorption heat pump installation at, at Armagh Resources Center, which we have delivered back in 2016 to 2018 for the flue gas condensation. Tested varma forsuning. Uh, we are actually a spin-off uh, of tested varma forsuning uh, back in the days when they implemented uh, the, the geothermal plant there. And, and the tested varma forsuning has, uh, has a makeup of a waste incinerator with about 80 megawatt of uh, fire capacity. They produce about 3.5 megawatt electrical power, of which they use half, half a megawatt internally. Then there's the geothermal installation, which produce around 7 megawatt uh, on, a, on a 1200 meter well with a flow of around 220 cubic meters per hour. It's been in operation since uh, in the 80s and is uh, one of the very uh, good uh, geothermal plants in operation today. In supplement to that, there's a 12 megawatt uh, straw burner pre predominantly put in to, to provide hot water for as driving energy for the absorption heat pumps for the flue gas condensation and for the geothermal uh, plants. Since the water only comes up at 42 degrees, uh, it has to be lifted significantly to, to come out. Uh, and uh, as, as, as district heating. And the way it works quite well is that in the summer, the waste incinerator on its own can, can manage to supply <coughs> district heating for the area and is actually spent something like 50 kilometers from Cliff Miller to North with Tisted in the middle. And they're bringing on more and more small towns because that will facilitate some of the issues that come when you do energy integration of, of uh, carbon capture. Then uh, when getting into the winter, we turn on the geothermal plant uh, and the straw burner and then has the capacity to get it through the winter with a little bit of help from gas burners in, in the really cold spells. I hope you are able to see this. Um, it just shows the route that the district heating water takes when it comes from the grid at 35 degrees. It goes through the flue gas condensation from the waste incinerator. Then it goes through the, then it's lifted further in the absorption heat pumps that draws uh, heat from the geothermal installation and the flue gas condensation on the straw boiler. Then it's lifted by the steam turbine uh, condenser. Um, there's a turbine condenser and a little bit extra can be added with a hot water plate heat exchanger and it comes out at 62 to 70 degrees depending on, on time of year. And we have a, a circuit of hot water at 160 degrees that is, uh, is used for driving the absorption heat pumps and the whole plant is being balanced with some, uh, some storage tanks so that we can balance this against the, the grid consumption. Um, we can turn off the, the straw and uh, use them we'll plant uh, within a few hours so we and we can scale them up quite quite well so so it's not too large of a storage tank. These are basically the numbers uh, uh, and the, the waste incinerator uh, has a, a emission of about 50 to 60 thousand tons of CO2 a year. Um, and that's actually one of the challenges that we sometimes get tend to be forgotten because we are a small emitter 
and uh, when you're trying to reach a goal, you're 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 cherry picking from the large end, and uh, it's, it's a fair uh, way down to us. But we still think we have some relevance because we we do have some agility that we can bring to the game. If you look at our first steps with the carbon capture, we start actually in 2018 when I started in ACG, I had uh, initial talks with with Anka from Amongas. At that point, he he didn't see any reason to 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 look at that. He had supplied many carbon capture units for uh, biogas plants, and they just released it back into the atmosphere. So he thought it was kind of funny that we were talking about doing it on a on a on a waste incinerator. But he called back in January of 2021 and said, well, there's a lot of political talk about this now, and I actually do have a small demonstration plant in a 40 foot container that we could maybe configure and use as, as a demonstrator plant in Tisted. Uh, so we didn't wait long. In March 21, we signed a collaboration agreement between uh, the uh, waste incinerator plant, the, the district heating plant, Amon Gas and ACG. And the basic of the, of the agreement was that everybody pays their own way through the project. Nobody, there's no money changing hands and we share the results with, within us. Also because the plant was pretty much ready to use with, with a few uh, modifications. The plant was er erected in May, June of 21 and was in operation from July to November. And in December, it was dismantled. Now, and what did we learn? Uh, we, we, we learned that a standard biogas upgrade capture system worked quite well. We could capture rate up to about 97.5 without being totally uneconomical. Maybe we could go a little bit down and have a more economical performance. We also validate, because that was one of the worries that the flue gas from incinerator plant would, would be uh, bad for the for the capture system, but we actually learned that it was quite well suited and could be used in a standard uh, amine plant. And we also got, uh, and that was made, that was mainly like from interaction on on the on the PI level. It looked as if the energy integration with the district heating system appeared to be realistic. Uh, we also learned a little about the environmental issues and that I mentioned. We actually forgot to to register with uh, the local authorities. So they, when they when they read in the in the press release that we had put this plan up, they they asked us for uh, if we've applied for economic uh, or uh, for a tiller uh, approval, and we hadn't. So we had to do that retrospectively. Otherwise, we would never have been able to do it in such short time. <laughs> <laughs> but we got we, we, we were forgiven. Mm -hmm. uh, but also asked not to do it again. <laughs> then um, what else we got was a lot of figures, a lot of, uh, first of all, a lot of, it sounds like we learned a lot and everything was solvable. Yes, but there are a lot of problems, a lot of issues, and we fit that into a checklist for a full-scale feasibility study and a carbon capture and storage uh, roadmap, which we then uh, decided to move forward with. Um, at that point, it was also kind of established that we were not going to be able to 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 bid for the for the first uh, uh, project for storage. So so we kind of said we we are going to uh, do feasibility studies in in the meantime. We established a steering a steering committee to drive the process. Amon Gas kind of exited. They learned that what they needed to learn, and 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 they were off to try and sell plants. Then we got a grant for full-scale feasibility analysis study from the CO2 Vision uh, Lighthouse project, mainly a number of hours. Um, and then we defined the roadmap and started the task. And there are basically six tracks in the roadmap. One is track one, which is technology. Track two is, is working with the transport and storage and utilization. Track three is an important one, is energy integration. Uh, and track four is uh, OPEX and CAPEX business model. Uh, and track five, which is closely related to number four, is uh, regulation. What is what is how does that feed into the capex opex? Because as engineers, we have the engineering capex and engineering opex, but but the economy of uh, waste to energy is very complicated from a regulation point of view. So we we also had a track from that where we we've had some external assistance on that. And track six is more or less. Uh, some scenarios bringing all tracks together in, in 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 a rolling model for saying if we were going to go tomorrow, what are we going to go with and what is going to, it going to mean? Because it's been developing all the way along. 
our paradigms was that we, we wanted to achieve energy cost neutral, neutrality, which I'll talk about a little bit. We also wanted to, to focus on mature technologies because we are a small plant. We don't want to undertake a, a technology development. And also because we saw that we had a, a good size compared to biogas plants, so that a lot of the OEM suppliers of equipment actually found that we, we the scale of their equipment was quite suited to the scale of TSTED. Uh, and then we said that we have to be agile and we also want to uh, be uh, sharing all the knowledge we know with everybody who wants to hear about it. Uh, so the, also therefore I'm happy to be here today. A little bit about the challenges we've had in, in, in the technology side with Amine technology. There are a number of challenges, um, uh, but um, one thing that works for us is our size because that makes it easier to implement it. But the, the problem is that the A-mine technology will require 140 degree driving energy in the reboiler. And that gives us challenges. Either we will uh, uh, reduce our electrical output to close to zero, um, or uh, we will have other challenges with the energy integration. But other than that, most of the, the challenges with A-mine technology were manageable because they have been implemented in many places. Then we've looked at the enzyme absorption technology uh, and explore that with suppliers. And it only requires about 85 degrees of driving energy for the reboiler, which means we, we, we can use uh, turbine condensate. We have a old fashioned design of turbines. So that means we can we can actually do a good energy integration uh, without uh, reducing elect electrical output. And also we looked at liquefaction uh, and I'm going more into the challenges. I mean, there are actually quite a few CO2 liquefaction plants in Denmark working off uh, upgrade systems. There's one in, in, in uh, Jorim, for example. But the problem that we were looking into at the point when we started in, in 19, 20, 21 was what are actually the requirements for the purity. Now, we don't have that problem anymore because uh, a de facto standard, standard has emerged, which is food, food grade. Um, we also at some point uh, and I'll come to that later, look at shall we, shall we do liquefaction or can we transport it in pipes as a gas? One thing we did learn uh, in the signal side, and I'll come to that in, in, in the next slide, is that we can achieve energy cost neutrality. That means that the driving energy is borrowed from the district heating production at a higher temperature and sold as a lower temperature to the district grid. So we're more or less borrowing the energy for, for, for the reboiler. Same principle we use when we when we do uh, uh, absorption uh, heat pumps. Um, then track number two about transport and storage. We there that was really the biggest problem we saw what to do with the damn stuff once you've caught it. And, and um, we've looked at pipeline solutions to Handstorm or Oralbock. We've also looked into establishing a, a storage facility for a ship transport out of Hanstall, which is about 20 kilometers from Tisted. We worked with Evita on that. And what we did learn very uh, firmly was that there is probably going to be a liquid pumping of CO2. So that kind of gave us the choice of liquefaction or not. That's a given. And uh, also, uh, we've worked a little bit with uh, Ineos and others, kind of learning that it'll be food grade that they will go for in order to have a good uh, technical solution for the pumping equipment that, that has to pump it into the wells. We also looked at, and there have been discussion about uh, power to X plants in Hanstorm because at some point there were plans for a lot of offshore wind energy to come that way in, and we could kind of make something about that. And then we've looked at truck filling stations and truck transport from tested to onshore storage. And the results are that um, trucking onshore is actually viable. Even though it's a little bit counterintuitive, it works quite well and it's not that expensive. Offshore storage out of Henstone could be viable on a long term basis. There are some good um, geological uh, structures out there that can hold a lot of CO2. But with our size, we have no way of driving that. So we're just going to have to sit and wait until that becomes interesting on a European scale. Then we could drive to other ports uh, and maybe ship out there. And that is also a possibility. I'm sure in Ineos would be happy to take our CO2 if we were to deliver it in SPR on truck. Um, but at the moment, if we were to go to tomorrow or sometime end of 25, which I think is when Sting Lille will be operational, then onshore 
trucking to Stenlilla would probably be the viable solution on the short term. We're also uh, quite sure, and I think everybody agrees, that, that carbon storage will be the viable option in the short term, but in the medium term, utilization will become hugely interesting. And then it be, starts becoming a viable commodity to, to have the CO2 available. Uh, this one here, I'm sorry for the size of the slides here. I hope you can you can read them. This is actually quite important one because it shows when, when you go, for example, at the top we have uh, our base situation today where we where we make three megawatt of electricity and 16 megawatt of domestic uh, district heating from the incinerator plant. Now this is this a, is this is a design study that treats everything being equal, which it's not, but it shows the scales. Now, if we were to implement an A-mine process with 140 degree driving energy and recapture that energy with uh, absorption heat pumps, we would have to have some, find some sort, and, and we still want to have three megawatt of electricity. We need to find some driving energy for that. And we've looked into establishing uh, straw boilers for that. Uh, and uh, it's all very feasible. We, and, and But district heating production that we need to offload into the grid more or less doubles through that exercise. We could go another way and use electrical heat pumps and uh, and then uh, uh, with a good COP, uh, we could we could uh, get this significantly down, but then we'd also lose the electricity production. And they are quite they're quite fond of the electricity production in, in Tisted, especially the last two years have been very favorable for that. So mm -hmm. it's been on the table that if we were able to keep that in, that would be very good. And here the enzymatic process actually it's pretty good for tested because here we can use the driving energy we can just take some of the turbine uh, condensate uh, driving <coughs> off the turbine con condensator uh, and that means that if we kind of put it together we would we would we, we would go up to 22 megawatt of heat output so it's 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 more manageable and with the expansion of the the the, the grid that should be manageable so and this has been uh, we put a lot of effort into that but that's why I'm saying we, we, we think everything else being equal, that we can get, have uh, uh, energy cost neutra neutrality. Uh, so all the energy that goes into this will at the end of the day be purchased by a, a district heating client. Then we go to track four and five, which was, if you remember was the OPEX CAPEX business models. The, the challenge was that in the beginning we didn't have anything to put into them, uh, but we have managed uh, also because we got a lot of um, publicity from the pilot stage, we, we managed to get good dialogue with quite a number of OEM uh, producers of carbon capture plants. So we've been able to have a market dialogue and get good budgetary CAPEX uh, and OPEX figures together for a, an A-mine plant. Uh, so we think we have a good model for that now covering uh, in, uh, investment and energy chemistry manpower and maintenance uh, OPEX costs. Also the OPEX figures for transport and storage of course was a major headache, headache but uh, Stinglilla is coming out with uh, budgetary figures of what it will cost from 25, end of 25 and they are manageable. Uh, so, so now we also can feed that into the, to the model. On the regulation side of it, what we've been trying to do, and this is not my area, I'm more uh, thermodynamics. We've been trying to 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 see when does when do the the the, the when do we cross about zero of above zero for for the point being when do we need to have this in place? At some point, it will become too expensive, for example, to operate the plant if we don't have it in place if we have CO2 taxes. Or in other cases, it could be beneficial to do it before, depending on how we can be taxed on the energy we reclaim from the capture process. It's very complicated, but we do have a, a target date set for when we expect the feasibility of full scale to cross about zero and up until yesterday evening or some, sometime in 28. But it's also changing all the time. Um, Current status and projection. If we had to lock our implementation plan today for tested, we would go for the following scenario. It would probably be an enzyme process. And I write some budget validation outstanding, meaning that uh, we have to, of course, be sure that we reach the right uh, price when we go out competitively to, to do this. We'll probably have liquid liquefaction to food grade CO2. 
it will probably be trucking uh, to onshore storage in Stin Lille. And we are currently aiming that we should be to have a readiness to be up and running from end to uh, royal families. So it's it's an extremely yeah it's an extremely popular container that we have. Yeah, and what makes the whole thing with Bex special? Uh, it's a need uh, from that's quite clear that we can't reduce all fossil emissions. Uh, and I perceive the uh, UN's uh, panel on climate change. Uh, they made these big reports uh, with latest one was the six assessment reports where they analyze scenarios for how uh, temperatures and CO2, greenhouse gases, all these things can develop in the future. They have analyzed uh, in this uh, uh, in this report over a thousand scenarios, and what is very interesting is that there are 284 scenarios that reach the Paris Agreement. All 284 relies of these scenarios relies on Bex in order, and, and this is the specific word used by uh, IPCC's counterbalance residual emissions. What that means is uh, the big problem with climate change is that we move CO2 from the bedrock, putting it into the atmosphere, and to do, uh, if we have a few emissions left, for example, if we use natural gas to make the chemicals for pharmaceuticals is one such area uh, that we might do still in the future, then we will need to counterbalance whatever is emitted by removing CO2 from the atmosphere, and one such option is specs. Uh, and and uh, Bex uh, over time removes CO2 through photosynthesis, binding the carbon from the atmosphere and then permanently storing it. So over time you move CO2 out of the atmosphere into permanent storage, which you can use to counterbalance. Our whole project is driven by the idea to commercialize negative emissions. That's the whole goal of it. it it's, there's really is no other goal. That's the specific goal of the Bex pro, uh, project in Stockholm is to commercialize negative emissions. Uh, so that those that sit with residual emissions should be able to counterbalance whatever they have left in the future. Um, so, so shortly asked about Stockholm XG, we're, we're an uh, independent firm that is co-owned 50-50 by Stockholm's uh, Stockholm Stad, that's uh, Stockholm Municipality and Ankeale, which is a joint venture by these, uh, the pension funds and uh, uh, insurance company listed here. Uh, and what we do, which puts boundary conditions for how we operate our, uh, our future negative emissions business, is that uh, Stockholm is uh, dreadful parts of the year, uh, many would say, if you like snow, then you might find it fantastic. I, I do like snow, but, but <laughs> especially in November, it's it's mostly just dark. Uh, like in 2014, when we had five hours of sunshine uh, for the whole of November in Stockholm. Uh, and then, then uh, when it starts snowing in December, it gets a bit better. But for parts of the year, the days are quite short and it's rather cold uh, uh, weather. And of course, the ice bears are photoshopped for uh, friends over the pond if they are attending. Uh, uh, so that's one part. We keep Stockholm hot by supplying district heating. Uh, but we also have this challenge in uh, in many cities around Sweden, actually, which I think you will have in uh, also in Denmark and other major cities in Europe. And that is that we've had rapid urbanization uh, during the last 20 years, where, and in the case of Stockholm, it's Stockholm has grown by uh, all, has almost doubled over the last uh, 20, 30 years, but the energy infrastructure hasn't. And this red line signifies how much electric power you can get in from the national grid into the city. Uh, and uh, the purple uh, graph is, uh, uh, is the amount of electric power required. Uh, so already today there's a deficit of electric power in Stockholm and for that reason, besides district heating, we as uh, an energy utility also holds with a production guarantee of electric power. So it's in, in base, basically a capacity market for electric power, whereby we guarantee if, if we go above this red line, we can supply up to 320 megawatts locally inside the city. So that's a second boundary condition 
First one is to meet demand for uh, hot water and heating homes. Second is to keep the electric power capacity uh, in requirements within limits in Stockholm. And as you can see, this varies on the table to the right. This varies to, to, uh, from year to year, and it's mainly depending on temperature. If it's really cold, then more is required. If it's uh, not that cold, it's less. So it's any, anywhere in, from zero to 500 hours per year. Yeah. So I, I, I stole this, uh, this uh, slide from Oliver Geden. He's uh, my, my uh, author on uh, in, uh, working group three of the la last big report on IPCC. Yeah, so the word he used was that it's unavoidable. And then he made all these references to, uh, to the different parts of uh, this report where you can find it. We can't reach the Paris agreements, which requires net zero CO2 or greenhouse gases during this century, if we don't counterbalance uh, the residual emissions, the hard to abate residual emissions. Uh, and we've been working on this uh, since 2016, actually, because you could see this development starting already with the last big assessment report. Like all big projects, uh, it started with desktop studies, having an idea, trying that. Uh, in 2018, we did a technology screening, uh, ending up with our particular technology that we like, hot potassium carbonate, which is a little bit unusual choice. Uh, I think uh, many would uh, consider, but it's very logical for us. Uh, and uh, we also uh, started in 2019, decided on uh, starting a research facility or pilot or test facility. You could use different names, but in essence, you could call it a pilot or research facility and we use it for research and uh, uh, trials, basically. Uh, the big container that we have, or small container, however you like it. And we constructed that one ourselves with, of course, with aid of consultants, but we didn't take delivery from any uh, solution provider, but did uh, the construction ourselves of the container. It took four and a half months, and then we had it operational, started capturing CO2. Uh, and then we have continued with uh, doing everything, preparing for full scale BEX. Our aim is to have full scale BEX by 2027. It was previously in 2026. And the reason why it's uh, taking a little bit longer is because uh, legislation in Sweden is moving a little bit uh, slower than it is in Denmark. So our original goal was 2026, but then as the political processes, uh, and, and it, it's not particular to uh, uh, only to uh, uh, negative emissions or BEX or CCS, it's uh, uh, we have a picture in Sweden of Dan Danish governmental offices moving quite fast within biogas and other things once you decide which. Uh, so hat, hat, hats off to that. Uh, but so our aim is now 2027, but we are in the middle of environmental permitting, procurement and all of these things. So we're out procuring the actual capture facility uh, as we are speaking, preparing everything for final decision so we can start building at the moment. Uh, when we do it, uh, when we build it, it look like this. Uh, so we use residues from forestry in Sweden. Its branches talk uh, sawdust and bark mainly, and also discarded wood that might be uh, damaged by uh, wildfire or bark beetle or similar things. So wood that can't be used for uh, pulp and paper or for the board industry. Uh, and uh, hot potassium carbonate is quite good if you have high concentrations of CO2. And the particular combined heat and power plant, which we are looking on putting this technology on, is uh, uh, was constructed in uh, 2016, and it has really, really good data for doing carbon capture. So the CO2 content in the flue gases are uh, is in excess of 18% uh, of the flue gas conversation. And having an 18% concentration of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, CO2 opens up for other choices than amines. Uh, what we also can do with this, with uh, hot potassium carbonate, is that we don't need any steam. Uh, so we're going to build, uh, to run the capture process with electricity. That's our main track, uh, as far as possible, because that means that we can take electricity from the turbine that we already operate, uh, and then run uh, the capture unit. And if 
we end up in this situation where we need to put more electric power into Stockholm. We can shut off the carbon capture, having the regular turbine going and delivering uh, electric power locally out into the uh, capacity, uh, uh, well, the capa in practice capacity market that we have in Stockholm. Uh, but during normal operations, uh, about half of the electric power will go to the carbon capture. So 60 megawatts of electric power. Uh, but because we have HPC, which is operating in the, the Sorber Tower at 105 degrees, uh, we will uh, be we will be able to capture, uh, not capture, but recover this heating from the process. So 105 degrees is uh, quite good temperature for uh, recovering uh, for recovering this heating. So uh, in we will spend about 60 megawatts of electric power, but in the end we will get 74 megawatts of electric power back. So with the design we're looking at, the total efficiency, the combined efficiency of district heating and electric power production will actually increase by three percentages. Uh, and the total plant efficiency will be at 112% once we put carbon capture on it. Uh, so that's the design requirement, being able to bypass and having full electric power production. Uh, I should also say uh, in terms of this, besides having 18% of CO2, we also have one of the largest installations of heat pumps on site. So it's more, we have more than 250 megawatts of uh, in uh, district heating, uh, uh, in district heating output capacity. Uh, it's more than 250 megawatts of heat pumps locally on site, which is also quite unusual, but that means that we can recover heat from more or less four degrees up to 105 degrees just looking at present energy flows within the plant. Uh, and that also makes uh, uh, makes the choice of technology more logical. Uh, and I think you will see this around the world that uh, uh, it looks very different uh, uh, and different capture technologies will be logical to have depending on your local conditions. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the latest architectural design. Uh, the plant that we have is, uh, see if I can get, it's up here, barely visible. Then we lead the flue gases in this piping down to the capture unit that we will put in the harbor. Uh, and uh, down here we already, so we own the harbor. So this is our energy harbor, it's co called uh, today, Energihamnen. And uh, uh, here we have a big jetty where we take in uh, uh, solid biomass, and we also can take in uh, bio oils on this jetty and so on. Uh, we're going to put intermittent, intermittent storage here on, uh, uh, on the pier, uh, and then we can take in ships uh, by this jetty. Uh, when we do that, uh, already today we can handle ships. The largest ships we've handled so far with, uh, uh, with bulk uh, capacities, uh, some 40,000 tons, uh, slightly above that. Uh, so we can take in quite large ships uh, into the harbor. So in terms of C2 capacity, 20,000 tonners should be possible. I don't know. We haven't decided on if that's optimal yet, but that's what we're working on. And of course, ending up in this design has been a lot of work because we uh, have been one of the ones uh, moving really early on in this uh, uh, in, in, in this market. And uh, uh, for example, how you should solve the concerns of having a lot of CO2, and this is also in the middle of Stockholm, uh, if there is a leak, all of these things. And then we have uh, seen that if we put a wall behind this, then we will get the flow. If there would be a leak, which is extremely low uh, uh, probability, then it, uh, the CO2 should move out into the water and not into the city. That's, that's one example of quite simple solutions. Uh, and then with simulations, we can see that this is uh, good enough for all, all, all things, uh, all scenarios that could be considered. Uh, yes, what more can I say? Yeah, and also about, uh, we have a lot of energy storage. Uh, so I saw Ark uh, showing that. So our, our one is almost twice as large as 45,000 cubic meters. Uh, but but uh, that's just to brag. Uh, otherwise, uh, I think I will round up there. Uh, so we'd be glad to take any questions later on uh, in relation to that. But, but our project where it is right now is we're preparing everything, procurement, all 
Eh, deals, eh, negotiations, everything that needs to be prepared for final investment decision. And eh, our date of having it commissioned, eh, our year of having it commissioned is 2027. And as I said, heads off for Denmark for eh, and Dörstedt eh, and the Danish government for moving fast. So uh, I think it's uh, quite impressive what we see. Thank you very much, Fabian. I think uh, what you have presented is also very impressive. Uh, you are far ahead, even though your year might be uh, one year later. Uh, let's see what happens in Denmark. Yes. Yes. Uh, it might be that you have or get late. <laughs> it could happen. Who knows? Who knows? Thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, to the audience, uh, I'd like to say uh, that uh, you're most welcome to use the Q&A uh, space already now in case you have uh, questions for Fabian or for the other speakers, please do so. And then I would like to uh, change, we'd like to change scale. I can see that uh, ship name is online here. That's very good. Uh, she's going to present an overview of carbon capture uh, technologies for small scale plants. Uh, we find, uh, as Christian said in the beginning of, uh, of the workshop, we in IA Bioenergy, we, we find interest in exploring options for small scale uh, uh, com, uh, options of carbon capture at small scale combustion facilities. And we have the luck that uh, Natural Resources Canada has already studied this topic thoroughly um and uh, not least that we are going to hear about that uh, that study uh, now uh, shepnam is a research scientist at natural resources canada and also a representative of, of canada in the in task 32 in ia bioenergy the floor is yours shepnam thank you um i don't have the option of taking the control over Sarah, can you help me out like you did before? Control. I'm wondering if we should share the slides that you sent then, uh, Shepnam? Yes. Um, or perhaps you should uh, quickly uh, leave the gonna... meeting and try again. Would that work? Do you see it? Yes. 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 Perfect. Do you see it in a presentation mode? Yes, yes we do. study background and design basis. This is in totally wrong place. Here it is. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. Sorry for this slight delay. Um, thanks for the opportunity. It's great pleasure to be here today with um, so many of you who are doing great things on the CCUS end of the things, as well as to the audience. Um, this presentation is an overview of um, carbon capture technologies suitable for um, small scale biomass combustion facilities and CHP systems. And I will also go into um, a bit details on a Canadian case study that we have done for one and a half megawatt thermal district heating system um, located here in Ottawa, Ontario, um, Canada. Um, my co-authors here, I would like to give and, and recognize their um, their help on, on, on putting this together. Um, I'm doing this presentation at my capacity as the Canadian National um, Task Leader for IEA Bioenergy Task 32. Um, the actual overview on the carbon capture technologies as well as pre pre uh, preparing this deck was done uh, by um, my colleague, Christine McFarlane, and another co-author, Kelly Atkinson, 
is our in-house um, expertise on the CCUS, um, and she was also one of the leading engineers um, on the on the Canadian case study. Um, a little bit about who we are. I'm not sure whether um, you're all familiar with um, with Canmet Energy Ottawa. Um, we are part of um, a research organization as part of um, federal government at Canada as part of Natural Resources, uh, Department of Natural Resources. We have a, over 100 years of um, expertise in the field of clean energy, and we have about currently 200 scientific and non-scientific uh, staff in our um, in our organization. I think Fabian did an absolutely wonderful job um, putting a context why BEX and its importance and the IPCC work that has been happening with a lot of um, modeling studies and the em emphasis that is being put on on the BEX. So I don't necessarily need to go into further detail on this. Um, maybe this is a good segue um, to to get, introduce you what you're going to be hearing um, in the next next 15 minutes. Um, I'll give you a high level technology overview of potential carbon capture technology types that are suitable for the small scale, both heating and combined heat and power plants. Um, we'll also share the results of an option analysis that CanMed Energy Ottawa has done for a client. Um, this was another federal government department um, for the for their district heating plan um, at that small um, district heating plan one and a half megawatt thermal capacity to evaluate um, CCU technologies carbon capture and utilization technologies for a potential demonstration. Um, let me put a framework around this work and how we started this. Um, the case study or the option analysis that I referred to before, this was done back in 2019 um, for the, for this district heating plan. Um, and when we started this project as part of the IEA, um, I put forward this study as a potential sharing its results. So any of the carbon capture technology analysis we've done, we really focus on the capture technologies and we updated the information on, on those. Um, and as a basis, we wanted to focus on the technologies that are at the demonstration scale. So we were looking anything with the technology readiness level of seven or higher. Um, and we applied several um, characteristics in terms of um, making this analysis for, um, for different technology types and relied mostly on the publicly available information. Um, I think you have heard quite a lot about what caption carbon capture technology types that could be considered um, for um, for these applications, um, and they are also applicable for for small scale. Um, we have slow, um, put down narrow narrowed down and focusing on the post combustion capture technologies, mainly looking into the temperature swing absorption on the absorption site, amine and enzyme enhanced um, carbon-based absorption. We included membrane and cryogenic uh, carbon capture. Also the oxycombustion as an alternative op option um, looking into it. Um, there are other uh, possibilities for capturing carbon. Um, that could be done at the pre-combustion, and that's also a commercially available um, technology. But we excluded this from the overview uh, simply because it wasn't necessarily done with the intent of doing CCS, uh, but more for just to control the syngas composition for um, various different downstream applications. And at the time we were doing this update on the um, on the capture technologies, chemical looping was not deemed um, at the TRL level that we were looking at. Most of those that we've seen is more at the TRL of six. So we excluded um, chemical loop looping as a result. Um, the technology characteristics that we looked at, um, you 
we group them into four groups, um, technology specific uh, data that we spend some time gathering information, environmental, operational, as well as economic information. Um, so in the technology side, um, very common criteria looking into the recovery rate, maximum achievable CO2 purities, um, what type of process inputs and utilities needed to operate this um, the process, um, as well as the types of products and byproducts being generated. On the environmental side, um, the main focus was looking into the disposal of liquid um, as well as gaseous streams um, and their disposal. On the operational flexibility, um, we narrowed it down to the sensitivity um, of the process to the flue gas composition. We attempted to gather more information um, such as turndown ratio, capture capabilities at reduced load, the startup times, um, but those information are not necessarily readily available um, on, the, um, on the literature, on the public. So that um, even though we started with those, we didn't necessarily find a lot. So um, we ended up not including in our analysis. And the lastly, the economic assessments, more looking into the total annualized cost. Um, so this is a very busy table. I don't want you to to think so deeply on what is in here, I'll go and highlight several things that are important um, that worthwhile mentioning. And you will, I understand, have a copy of the presentation. So um, hopefully you could spend some time if you wish to. Um, what I would highlight from this table is the um, among the different capture technologies considered from TSA to amine or enzyme-based um, absorption technologies, membrane, cryogenic, and oxycombustion. Almost all of them um, are at the TRL level, but the amine absorption are much higher, closer to this eight, even nine, um, in terms of TRL level. Um, any of these technologies that we uh, looked at are um, able to um, recover the CO2 um, close to 80%, um, and some of them could even go higher higher than that. In terms of the purity, um, again, all of them were able to get the um, purity of the CO2 in the gas um, up to 95%. And in terms of process inputs and utility needs, um, we see a good variation in terms of what needs to be put it into the process um, and that change from the technology um, from one to another. Um, particularly uh, worth mentioning, depending on the process, the cooling water needs, the um, steam needs, the heat needs, um, the process water, they really do change. Um, and in the absorption and absorption technology types, that is a significant element that one needs to consider. Um, for those in the membrane and cryogenic carbon capture and oxycombustion um, technology types, um, those process inputs are less, but at the same time, their power needs are much, um, much higher. So continuing on the same overview, um, this is a um, continuation of, of the previous table, but looking more on the um, environmental and the economic aspects. Again, um, all capture technologies um, appear to be sensitive um, for the NOx, SOx and PM, and, and they need to be removed from the flue gas, um, except the cryogenic and the oxycombustion technology types. Um, and some technologies such, such as absorption and membrane, they also require um, drying for the flue gas um, so that the, 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 the moisture is being removed from, from the gas. In terms of the liquid effluents and the... Um, oops, sorry. Here we are. In terms of... In terms of liquid um, effluents as well as the gas disposals, um, the absorption technology-based um, types 
appears to offer um, an advantage because they don't necessarily produce any toxic materials um, as compared to the absorption um, based. But the enzyme enhanced carbonated based absorption technologies particularly um, appear to have less toxicity on their um, liquid um, effluence. And on the membrane and cryogenic sites, um, there is a concern that one needs to pay attention to um, the pH level in the effluents could be too low. Um, so one needs to make sure that the municipal regulations and uh, limits on, on those are, um, are being followed. Um, when we look at the total annualized cost, um, this is in Canadian dollars per ton of CO2 captured. The range is pretty wide, um, but clearly absorption-based technology seems to be um, at some cost um, competition in here, um, and they're leading um, with a lower cost compared to, to the others. The car cryogenic carbon capture um, is relatively low cost in here um, and compared to comparable to the absorption. Um, but most of the time, these are also um, being seen as a secondary um, CO2 capture technologies add, add on. So that could be another consideration to, to keep in mind. So highlights from the case study. Um, the next couple of slides is going to be more on that, but let me start with giving a um, background on, on the study as well as design basis. So this is a plant in Ottawa, it's Confederation Heights Central Heating Plant. Um, it supplies hot water to, um, to a building of eight. Um, it's owned by the Public Services and Procurement Canada. Um, and they are the one who initiated this study for potential implementation of the carbon capture and utilization to meet the greening government strategy target of um, minimum of 50% net reduction in GHG emissions. So this is a boiler using wood chip fire. Um, it has, the, the plant itself has um, multi-cyclone as well as backhouse to remove the um, particulate matters. Um, and it produced um, about 16 ton per day um, CO2. Or um, this is this this was into the design basis. So what are the other design bases that um, that was looked at? Um, the minimum capture rate was put at 10 ton per day for the CO2, um, so that this gives a little bit of buffer um, for indirect emissions. There was a desire of um, having the system working 220 days per year and all rotating equipment drivers to be electric. So what this study has done in this technology options, um, it was a level and staged approach. In the first um, level one screening, there were about 50 technologies being evaluated. And the basic criteria on that level one screening, um, looking at the TRL levels and understanding whether they are meeting those um, conditions for the TRL seven or higher. Um, as a result of the level one screening, they identified 20 capture technologies Sorry, they um, they started with 20 capture technologies, 21 on the utilization, and seven combined capture and utilization technologies. And at the end of the uh, level one screening, they ended up having um, multiple technologies that they have taken to the level two screening. And in the level two screening, the analysis um, criteria mostly applied whether this was demonstrated at the scale required for the facility, whether the technology provider had a presence in North America um, and the application logistics um, for the plant itself, and whether there were enough information made available um, to, the, uh, um, to the people who did the analysis for the next stage. Um, as a result of this, there were narrowing down of the technologies from the um, 50 to 11, um, four capture technologies, four utilization technologies, and three combined capture and utilization technologies. So 
this slide um, is a um, again a busy slide. Um, I don't want you to go through um, so much on this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I will have a couple of graphs following up on this. All that to say um, is this highlights at the very top um, highlights different technology types that are being considered um, for for the analysis and some of the key metrics that have been included in the analysis. Um, in the TRLs and the CO2 products are important, but one of the elements was making sure that the trucks coming into the plant, leaving the plants for, for the solvents or for the, for the biomass, the space requirements, um, the turndown ratios, the actual space, um, tower stack heights, all these logistic details have also been included in the in the case study. So this is the cost assessment graph um, for all the technologies that are being um, looked at. So what it's really um, highlighting in here, um, if you look at the the left side of, of this graph, um, most technology types that are being considered and um, investigated here um, will, will be costing between 10 million to $25 million um, for, for this one and a half megawatt thermal district heating system, um, except the algae production where the actual cost of capital investment, as you see here, was much higher. In terms of um, looking into and making your attention to the second end, which is the enzyme enhanced carbon based um, technology, absorption technology. Here there was, um, as, as you see, the cost of the capital investment is, is much less, but also the operating costs and total revenue seems to be um, very close to each other. So um, all that to say in this, preliminary analysis, um, looking at um, the different technologies, it is fair to say that um, cost of up to 25, 30 million seems to be reasonable, but there are certain technologies out there might cost uh, much higher. Um, when one starts um, considering capture and utilization together. One other aspect that we have um, did in in this assessment um, for for this small for the, for this um, confederation height is looking at the LCA studies. Um, our client was very adamant on making sure that there is a threshold of that fifty percent is being met, um, and the overall governance in the, in the whole process that we are making sure that there are no um, CO two is being generated and we are maintaining that capture and the negativity. So um, so that LCA. Partial LCA analysis was carried out for um, for all technologies, 11 technologies that um, been identified. Um, and this graph is particularly looking into the capture technologies. So um, what you are seeing here with the dash line at the global warming potential of 0 0.2, that's the threshold limit of 50% net reduction that we put um, for this study as a target. So, um, and this partial analysis suggested that both enzyme enhanced carbonate based absorption as well as membrane option seems to be um, competitive and meeting the threshold limits um, for, for the, of the 50%. In terms of um, partial LCA, for the utilization and combined technologies. The picture is slightly different. Um, let me help you to clarify this graph. Um, hopefully it's, it's clear. Um, but at the back end of the, um, of the graph, what you're seeing is the highlights of the, um, it's much zoomed in for, for those um, six technology types that you're seeing at the bottom. Um, and the second one from the left is in fact goes beyond and we capture this and zoomed into this um, for this enhanced mineral mineralization um, option because it was beyond um, the limit of 
um, what is on the axis. So it's it was much higher. So we just zoomed in to, to highlight and put it in a perspective in comparison to, to the others. So um, it is clearly enhanced mineralization um, on the cost side might be um, might be good, but from the LCA uh, perspective, um, there were some considerations, and um, especially on the enhanced mineralized um, mineralization, the the issue was related to the chemical production, um, and that was really adding up quite to the um, global warming potential. Now the other option on the utilize uh, combined utilized. Um, and capture and utilization technologies was the impact of where the plant is located, what type of uh, fuel production that is being used. Um, and particularly in this case, the capture technology was looking into the fuel production. Um, and then it was also using hydrogen for this. So where the hydrogen, what kind of um, hydrogen source is being used for that um, combined um, technology type, as well as what is the electricity grid cleanness is, has a big impact in terms of what that um, global potential and CO2 reduction could look like. And that this is what you're seeing on the right hand side of this graph um, of, of the same technology types, but the first one is using steam methane reforming for hydrogen production in this particular technology option. Um, and the second one in the middle is looking at um, Ontario electricity grid and the intensity, carbon intensity for the Ontario grid um, using electrolysis for hydrogen production. Um, and then the very last one on the right is the Quebec electricity grid, which is very heavily relied on renewables hydropower so that the grid um, carbon intensity is much lower. As a result, hydrogen production through electro electrolysis is, um, is making a big impact on the LCA. Um, and this is, um, this is really giving a very different picture in terms of how different technologies could be compared on the LCA basis. Um, I'm going to be wrapping up um, the presentation, and here are some of the key um, takeaway messages on the capture technologies overview. Um, we look at absorption, the temperature swing absorption, absorption both amine and enzyme enhanced carbonated um, carbonate based technologies, membrane, cryogenic, and oxycombustion. And this overview indicated that all the types of um, all the considered types show promise to be suitable for small scale um, heating systems. Most of them are giving the capture rate of CO2 in the range of 80% um, and with resulting CO2 purity going up to 95% even higher. Um, the energy requirements do vary widely depending on the technology type. Um, the TSA, Absorption and membrane technologies are sensitive to the flue gas uh, composition and the PMs, NOx and SOx needs to be removed. Um, on the absorption, the solvents can be to toxic and liquid affluence needs to be processed further before discharging. And then total annualized cost to capture one ton um, of CO2 also vary widely. In terms of our case studies results, um, the detailed technology evaluation of the CCU technologies for one and a half megawatt thermal wood chip district heating plan identified a number of technologies, both on the capture utilization and combined capture utilization technologies. Um, capture technology seems to be uh, more higher at the TRL level compared to the utilization and the combined capture and utilization. There um, we see a wide range in capital investment, um, both for all, um, all types of technologies that we looked at. The CO2 capture facilities need, to exp um, need not expected to add considerable com complexities to the operation of the heating plant. However, once we start getting into the utilization, um, one expects to bring further complexities um, to the operation of the heating plant. And I think we have heard um, others expanding on this um, earlier. 
In terms of the capital cost and additional O&M cost for the CO2 capture and utilization, um, CO2 capture and utilization facilities will entail additional con power consumption. Um, heat integration is going to be an important um, aspect one needs to consider. Um, and additional costs could be offset through the sales of some of the products, CO2 derived products, so that the balance um, on, the, on the business model could, could be achieved um, somewhat. Um, and there's also a wide variability in terms of net emission reduction attainable from, um, from the life cycle perspective. Um, just wanted to finish up with some acknowledgement. Um, the, the group of researchers and engineers work on the case study, um, as well as Public Service and Procurement Canada, who have um, initiated this work, brought this work to us, um, and funded this work. Um, we also get some funding support from internal um, funding um, sources within NRCAN. Thank you very much for your attention. In the, in the um, presentation deck, you will find several pages of supplementary documents going a bit more in detail on, on what I have spoken in here, but um, we'll leave that for you to look at it at your own time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shebnam. Very interesting, very thorough, as I said in the beginning. <laughs> uh, that was good uh, to hear, and uh, we will uh, we'll hear if there are any any questions to you uh, in uh, a little bit later on, in 20 minutes' time, I think. <clears throat> I think it will also be interesting to see if uh, things uh, from your study can, uh, the findings from your study can, uh, can be um, uh, taking into other countries and other settings and see how that uh, that can inspire others to, to think in the same direction. Small scale catch up. OK, thank you very much. We will uh, proceed uh, now with the last uh, presentation. We're going to hear about what is going on in, uh, in Copenhagen, in the district heating system of Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, at uh, Amea Werkel uh, in Copenhagen. It is owned by the supply company of uh, Copenhagen. The company is called Hofor, and Anas is employed there as the chief consultant within energy systems and uh, carbon capture. And he is furthermore familiar with the, the works of IA Bioenergy and, and Task uh, 32 specifically, since he used to be the Danish representative in, uh, in uh, Task 32. So Anas, the floor is yours once we have given you the microphone. Thank you, Morten. Um, <clears throat> name and affiliation was covered by you, thank you. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. I just uh, want to briefly um, explain to you the uh, context of our uh, preparations to uh, maybe establish a carbon capture plant at the uh, Amarverget owned by HOFO. Uh, First of all, the location, uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, Denmark, uh, we're located in the northeastern part of uh, Copenhagen uh, at Amarverk. We own uh, this plant, which produces electricity and heat to the city of Copenhagen, um, connected up to the district heating network. I'll come back to that, but just briefly two slides that I will not go through, but you can look them up in the uh, presentation uh, that are available afterwards about uh, who are who for. We are a utility not only owning Amarverket and connected to the district heating network supplying district heating, but we are also active in water supply, sewage, town gas, biogas, renewable uh, energy in the form of wind turbines, electricity production and solar electricity production. Um, yeah, so, so it's a very uh, wide and large company with, with a lot of different activities, but owned uh, in, in the context of Amarverket and our district heating network, that is the city of Copenhagen. In the other services, it's the other cities in the uh, central Copenhagen and suburban areas around Copenhagen that are covering water supply and so on. Uh, company figures here for your reference later on. 
Um, the importance of district heating, this is a graphics to illustrate the uh, the extent of the district heating network in uh, Copen in and around Copenhagen. Uh, we are located in the northeastern uh, part, uh, where we also have our neighbors, uh, ERC, Amar Resource Center. You heard about their project on carbon capture earlier today. They're right next door to us. Uh, we have Avedeur, we have it south of the city with, with two wood pellet fired uh, boilers uh, owned by Ørsted. We have um, uh, Vista burning in the north using uh, waste to uh, to generate electricity and heat. We have a similar plant in Roskilde and we have numerous uh, um, peak load uh, boilers operating on natural gas and oil in, in the system as well. A small combined heat and power plant on wood in Køge. So it's an extensive system with uh, many actors. Uh, we are one of them. We are probably the biggest, I think. Um, uh, and the largest, uh, the, the heat load on a very cold winter day is just for, for the for explaining the magnitude of this is uh, about 3,500 megawatt. For a uh, carbon pack capture project to be feasible in in, uh, in a Copenhagen context, it is our opinion that that the recovered heat from the carbon capture processes are very important for the economics. Um, heat has a value in the city of Copenhagen. Uh, consumers pay for heat. Uh, and the value of this heat, if, if uh, it can become an income stream to the project, this is very favorable for the um, for the project as such. And it's not the only driver we have uh, for our interest in it, but it's certainly important for us that, that district heating, we are district heating company. Hope for a strategic look into these issues. Uh, Sepnin mentioned a lot about uh, other processes than the core process of carbon capture. Uh, we also heard in the the modeling from from Jesper Verling on on, uh, on uh, synthesis processes producing methanol and so on. Uh, our initial uh, analysis of, of these options in in uh, carbon capture in the power to X etc um, has led us to have a focus on uh, the carbon capture process as such. That is because we are connected to the digital heating networks, we are suppliers of digital heating, but also because uh, the, the power implications of owning a combined heat and power plant using wood chips. Um, and that, that leads us to, to a simplified situation as compared to a situation where we were looking further into synthesis and methanol production, as an example, producing in, in hydrogen and producing uh, fuels for, for airplanes and ships and so on. It's not that we won't look into it further. It's not that it's not possible for Ho4. We are just uh, starting our efforts in these new technologies with a focus on carbon capture. <clears throat> this is the uh, overall picture of, our, of the site we are looking into. Uh, it is called Amager Werket. It is right next door to to the downhill uh, skiing slope, but it is not the same thing. If you see it from Copenhagen, people look at the smokestacks and they say, oh, that's where they burn waste and run down on skis, but that's not us. We're behind it, but we're rather invisible because all the uh, the facilities of ARC are hiding us from the, from the eyes of the Copenhageners. Um, we own there a two operating units. Uh, there is unit one and unit four on a, on a power plant site, which is a peninsula pointing towards Sweden. Um, from left to right, we have unit number one, uh, which is in operation on wood pellets. Uh, the two units in the center of our row of the uh, power plant units, uh, number two and number two are out of operation, uh, former coal fired units. Uh, the coal fire unit number three was taken out of operation in uh, a few years back when we started the operation of unit number four, which is wood chip fired. So it's 100% bioenergy. Uh, we're using about a million tons of the wood chips a year. Uh, and that, that leads us to a, a position where we can uh, uh, start with the potential of capturing about 1 million tons of carbon dioxide relatively large facility we have uh, in, further out in the peninsula we have large areas where we're handling fuels we receive ships on the southern side of the peninsula uh, more uh, three ships space for three ships at a time on the northern side of the peninsula we can have ships as well and we are preparing ourselves to be able to take ships on the eastern side of the peninsula as well that could be a future for reception of more fuel so it could also be a future where uh, carbon dioxide ships will be arriving at our facilities 
wood chips in large uh, indoor covered storages, wood chips outdoor storage, uh, and and the main location for our plant uh, is uh, actually quite next to um, to the present unit number four. We have the smokestack of unit four, and that is the source of the uh, carbon dioxide. It's about, I think it's about five meters in diameter, so it's pretty large. And this uh, power plant unit is now out of operation, unit three. So this is where we prepare ourselves to take down uh, specifically the uh, flue gas cleaning equipment from the former unit and uh, establish an absorption uh, plant, uh, our corresponding uh, mechanical, electrical equipment uh, in the area between the smokestack of unit uh, number three and the boiler building of unit three. So this is an, an area of some, I think, 10,000 square meters or something like that, uh, which according to our consultants, we're a bit worried about it, but according to our consultants, this is sufficient to, to, uh, to establish an, uh, a carbon capture plant. Um, our plan is to uh, use the take the smoke from from the smokestack in unit three. It's relatively cold. It's went through flue gas condensing before it, it goes into the smokestack, so it's in the order of 35 to 40 degrees. Cross it over the open area, uh, take out the carbon dioxide in the absorption plant, and then we'll re release the uh, new the uh, 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 carbon dioxide free gas in the old smokestack from unit number three. That is still to be determined whether that is practically feasible, uh, but that is at, at least our intention as it looks now. Is transportation also inside that? Uh, transportation? transportation and liquefaction. Um, sorry, again. Can you fit in liquefaction and compression inside that area as well? Not liquefaction. No, sorry. Uh, the, the this is uh, the, for in this area we are uh, um, assuming there would be space in the case uh, we will transport the uh, CO2 from the plant in uh, in a pipeline as compressed gas. That would be possible and feasible in that area. In the case we need to liquefy and, and send by ships from the peninsula, uh, we would use an area to the northern side uh, over here, or maybe expand the uh, the peninsula further into Earth to create space. Uh, for, for new equipment in the current capture plan. So I think the the um, the most interesting about um, discussing the the opportunities to install a, a carbon capture plant in a large um, in a large scale bioenergy facility is is uh, not to explain all the solutions that we know for certain, but also explain uh, to you that there are uncertainties in such a project. Uh, and some of the obstacles or the, some of the discussions, some of the issues that are relevant for, for our project work uh, are stated in the little this list. I will go through some selected points and, and, and cover some of our, our considerations regarding these different issues. And, and you are very welcome to ask further questions to, uh, to dig de deeper into it during the uh, later uh, panel debate. Um, you also already mentioned the, the question about what, what is the uh, form of CO2 that we are releasing, which direction out of the peninsula will we take it? Is it to an onshore or an offshore storage? Is it by pipeline or is it by ship? Uh, the, the relevant answer to these questions when it comes to our uh, plant in the present situation is that, that we don't know yet. Uh, there's no pipeline, there's no ships, there's no contracts yet. Uh, what we are preparing ourselves for uh, is the uh, coming bidding round for government support next year. We assume that government support from the Danish uh, Energy Agency uh, uh, given by the Danish government and the taxpayers of Denmark uh, will be available next summer. And we assume that these uh, will, the, the, the bidding round will be open next summer. And we assume that, that these will be a major income source for us. The, the main thing about a business case is not even mentioned here in the list of, of issues. The business case is that you need to create an income for carbon dioxide. Um, the Stockholm approach, uh, we are commercializing carbon dioxide. That is the same thing. We need to create an income. Uh, otherwise, the project will not uh, go through FID in, in the board of uh, the whole form. Um, 
and the support scheme have, have uh, a, um, a deadline next summer, and uh, we don't know yet about storages. There's no pipeline, there's no decisions, there's no decisions about uh, offshore or onshore storage. There are decisions in Northern Light, but not decisions about onshore storage in ceiling, which could significantly lower our costs, but still an uncertain thing for us. Uh, CO2 quality standards, temperature, pressure, and state are really important, uh, and so also the purity standards. Uh, to start with the purity, it was mentioned earlier that, that the Northern Light standard could be a reference for everybody because that's easy. The pumps uh, have uh, no problems with this standard, the uh, pipelines and so on. But I'm not sure it's the optimal uh, solution because the, 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 the uh, less pure the, the carbon dioxide needs to be, the less equipment, cleaning equipment will be needed at the uh, facility to produce the carbon dioxide. So it's cheaper at a lower quality. So in my opinion, we don't know that a very pure quality is the optimal solution. Uh, when it comes to technology, we're discussing two solutions. Uh, A-mine is probably our main uh, track, uh, the solution that most people look into. Uh, for instance, climate school in, in, uh, in uh, Oslo, as we heard about. But uh, HPC has been chosen in Stockholm and has tricked uh, us into to looking further into HPC as a solution because um, Stockholm is very similar to us. It's the same fuel, same technology, same size, more or less a big city district heating dependence. So why did they choose uh, HPC? So we looked, spent quite a lot of uh, effort in looking into uh, HPC and, and have not made a final decision on, on this yet. But now we are at a stage where we have knowledge in these two technologies to enable us to to um, either flip a coin or put both of them in, 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 a, in a tendering process or, or choose the one that has a relatively margin uh, in, in, in some of the uh, criteria we're choosing from. Uh, scale is an issue. Um, the money that until very recently was available in the next funding round was only half of what we need. Uh, so if we were dependent on government support, uh, we could not use uh, the, the, the scale that was in the, in the one month ago uh, um, uh, public funding available. Now it's the, the first round is 0.9 million tons of carbon dioxide. That would suit us very well. That's about the size we have for, for captured CO2. 1 million in the smokestack, captured 0.9 million. Uh, but then there would be no CO2 support for anybody else than us if we win that competition. I need to put a, a, a disclaimer in here. We have not decided in O4 to participate in the bidding round. What we're doing now is engineering and feasibility studies to prepare ourselves to make a decision uh, on whether to participate or not in the bidding round for Danish government support next year. Uh, but uh, we, are, we are right now, because of the, the more money available now, we're looking into probably a full-scale plant at, uh, at our facilities. But we're really still looking into maybe there could be economic optimizations in building a slightly smaller plant. Uh, steam supply, major issue mentioned also by some of the other speakers. Uh, it's very costly in energy consumption. Everybody who works with carbon uh, capture knows that. Um, we have a steam turbine at uh, Unit 4, which is designed for producing electricity and in the back end to produce district heating, but there's no access to a steam, which is what we need for, for instance, an A-mine solution. So we need to do something about steam supply, find a solution, either use fresh steam or another solution. We also have steam available from Unit uh, number 4, sorry, Unit number 1, uh, which might be an option for some part of the year. Uh, district heating dependencies, uh, also mentioned earlier, uh, we want and need to uh, recover the heat from, from uh, carbon capture into the district heating network, but the Copenhagen district heating network is very warm. Uh, it's in, in the transmission grid, grid line, it's in the order 100 to 110 degrees, and in the local uh, pipeline systems, it's in the order of 80 to 90 degrees, which compared to, for instance, Tisdale is, uh, is uh, very warm. It makes the need for heat pumps higher. And uh, that's that's um, makes the cost higher, investment cost, and gets new in the operational cost for electricity to the heat pumps. We're working not only for this reason, but also for other reasons to reduce the temperature level in, in Copenhagen. If this is successful, that will reduce our uh, dependencies towards high temperatures in the heating network. 
We're also looking into process optimizations. Uh, we think there's a lot to do in, in, in uh, process uh, development uh, regarding the AMINE process or the HPC process itself. Uh, the, uh, the capture rate is not just a set figure. The capture rate you want as high or pos as possible, or you want 95%. No, you want your economic optimal capture rate because there's a dependency between the capture rate and the size of the equipment. The, the larger the equipment, the more expensive equipment, the higher the capture rate, but the optimal, economic optimal uh, rate is some probably significantly lower than what the manufacturers would sell to you. Footprint and layout, uh, we need to have space for the plant. We do think we have the space uh, as it looks now. Uh, a little bit in doubt whether the situation will, will be comfortable for us in the case where we need to liquefy. Because if we need to liquefy the carbon dioxide, uh, that would require an extra, uh, you could say, a factory, an, an extra process diagram where we clean, uh, cool down, and liquefy and store liquefied carbon dioxide at minus 25 or minus 50 degrees in pressure tanks uh, at the uh, case site in in uh, in uh, Amarberg. and it's costly uh, and from an overall perspective it's not necessary to do all this cooling and, and local handling uh, what we need is to put the co2 in the underground so so the the uh, decision uh, in the first lines about onshore offshore and pipelines of ships is very important also in terms of what kind of equipment should be installed at Amarberg. This is simply a much larger and much more expensive factory we want to build in case we need to liquefy. So we'd rather avoid it, but it's probably, we don't know, it, it might not be possible to avoid it. The Danish government support scheme uh, is not an obstacle, it's support, but it's also there's a perspective in this which is interesting in a room like this one where several of the Danish point sources are, are uh, present. Uh, it creates competition between the Danish punch sources, uh, which is uh, yeah, probably good for the Danish government, for the taxpayers, but it's not good for us as project developers. We would rather talk in details with our competitors and, and learn from each other what are your experiences, what are your technology choices, can we cooperate on a pipeline, etc. Uh, but the the, uh, the competition that, that is part of, of a competition for government support uh, gives us uh, restrictions on what we can say and how we can cooperate, unfortunately. Other income streams is about how we can create a supplement to, to government support, government support in the in our case, one uh, very necessary uh, probably for, uh, for, for, for a company that has a pure bioenergies uh, income, that is an advantage, it's pure bioenergy because we have maybe better options to sell uh, our um, certificates for stored carbon in the underground to companies or others uh, that are interested in, in CCS as a um, way to, to mitigate their company or related uh, carbon dioxide emissions. We're different uh, when we compare ourselves to fossil emitters, and that includes, for instance, the Danish industrial emitters, um, or, but also the uh, fossil part of, uh, part of, of uh, waste incineration, where uh, there's an, a potential income stream for a carbon dioxide uh, capture project from uh, ETS quotas and from the coming uh, carbon dioxide tax in Denmark. We don't have that option because it's uh, biological, which means that our uh, our uh, requirement for import or uh, sorry for, for support or for other incomes is probably bigger than uh, companies that has a fossil uh, component in their uh, smokestack CO2. Time, time schedule is a major issue for us. Uh, we are really happy we did not uh, participate in round one about competition uh, about money in Denmark. Uh, the, the time frame for, for next summer looks more feasible but still it need, we need to work very fast with environmental improvement, um, decision making about all these uh, issues that I mentioned here, uh, financing and so on. Uh, so so it, it's a tight schedule, it, it looks feasible, uh, but it's tight. And with the, as I mentioned, we have not made a discussion, a decision yet. Life cycle assessments, uh, it looks like there's a, a demand that, that uh, for instance, as Sipna mentioned, that, that some uh, parts of the say off-taker market for carbon dioxide captured uh, require a life cycle assessment and certain uh, threshold 
for for uh, how much the effect of uh, of a carbon capture plant uh, actually has when you look at the, uh, the final uh, emissions to the atmosphere, including all the indirect and direct effects of what's happening around the carbon dioxide plant. The most important one is probably the steam consumption. If we are using steam uh, from our turbine line, that means that the electricity production would be much less. Also, as, as uh, Jesper's uh, models from from uh, Skærbæk market show, the, the reduction in, in uh, electricity production is very significant, and that electricity has to be produced somewhere else. That, in, in the end, will end up with uh, a carbon dioxide emission somewhere else, initiated by our reduced consumption, production. Also, carbon dioxide in uh, transport, ships, and so on, uh, compressors, evaporation of the carbon dioxide from if you have a track truck that runs uh, across the country there's a heat influx to your to your stock of the liquid uh, and cryogenic co2 there will be an evaporation if you're not able to capture that and reliquify it you have a loss of carbon dioxide also leakages and so on in pipelines and so on must be considered if you're looking at it in an lca perspective we have started a study of this uh, don't have results uh, yet so it'll probably go some time we have a large risk assessment. This is a, to a company like ours. It's a, it's a, it's a risky project. Uh, some of them are very familiar, when we, like when we're building a power plant unit. Uh, you can, there's a component, uh, it might break down, the plant can't operate. Okay, we, we double this component, or we put a spare part in the, in the spare part uh, storage. Uh, but a lot of the risks are unfamiliar to us. Uh, we haven't built a carbon dioxide plant before, and, and what is uh, really important here is that the main income stream, which we're looking into public support from the government of Denmark, uh, are not uh, do not care about the problems we may have. Uh, they want carbon dioxide stored in the ground as the counted metering one ton of carbon dioxide. Okay, that uh, gives out a certain sum of money as government support. But we don't have control of parts of the infrastructure. We don't have control of the chips, we don't have control of the uh, underground storages, the pumping and the intermediate storages and so on. What happens if there's, uh, uh, for instance, public uh, opponents uh, against the, the, uh, the storages uh, that are being discussed, either in the North Sea or onshore, uh, maybe Hounshire in Western New Zealand, which could be a good option for us. Uh, local opposition has uh, an, an earlier stages of development of carbon dioxide capture in Denmark uh, led to, to a project failure. Uh, it was simply stopped by, by local op opposition against it. So there's risk associated with the issues that we cannot really control. That, that's, a, that's a major thing for us. Also, there's lots of economic risk and technology risk and so on. I won't go into details about that. And then there's of course ownership and financing, and, and the list could go on uh, under the under the slide here uh, and, and take forever to explain all the considerations we are doing. Uh, it's very interesting to do this. We we, we are hopeful that this will be a success uh, for us. Uh, when there's a competition about uh, money uh, in all the income stream, potential incomes, there's technology and so on. Uh, but we're confident that that the um, also, some of the wider perspectives mentioned from from Stockholm that this is necessary for the climate will at some stage, maybe not in the in the next year's funding phase or the coming years after this funding, but but at some stage someone will need this. It's in someone mentioned 204 scenarios on how to reach the Paris Agreement uh, uh, targets, and it's in all of them. Uh, so someone in one day will find the solution for us. If we don't find the solution in the, in the present situation, it will come in the next uh, few years, probably. We are one of the best places to locate it in Denmark because we have a relatively new plant and because it's uh, based on 100% biogenic CO2 and it is, um, uh, it's in a good location with all the facilities of electricity and heat and, and uh, access to ships and so on nearby. So we are hopeful, but we are not certain. Thank you. I thank you, Anas. Can I just uh, maybe can put the microphone here? Just on top. There. Thank you. Very interesting, Anas. Uh, I think uh, that you maybe already moved into a little bit into the the discussion with your uh, with your bold uh, points on 
and uncertainties uh, in, in, in all the work uh, that, must, that is going on 